Um, this program is about freezing the harvest. And just a little background first, we are um, Rutgers Cooperative Extension. We are an affirmative action equal opportunity employer presenter. Our programs are open to everyone. We believe in justice for all. And if you have concerns about that, you certainly should uh, reach out to the state um, administrative office and express those concerns. Cooperative Extension is part of a network and the New Jersey Agricultural Experiment Station at the state level. With the, we're part of this national network through the land grant universities. And both of those things enable us to present programs across um, counties, across the region and share resources. So the presentation tonight was uh, based on one out of the University of Georgia. And they also house what we call the National Home Food Preservation Center. Um, and there are lots of resources there that we'll talk about later. We have three programmatic areas, Family and Community Health Sciences, which does food, nutrition, and health. Hi, Joanne. Um, 4-H Youth Development for children in kindergarten through one year out of high school and hundreds of volunteers who um, make that program possible. And then Agriculture and Natural Resources, which includes uh, the master, Rutgers Master Gardeners, uh, works with farmers, um, homeowners, organizations, communities to um, on issues related to horticulture, uh, agriculture, water quality, environmental issues. So, so some of the advantages of freezing are that most foods can be frozen. We started with this session because it's the easiest probably of all the food preservation methods and one that almost everybody does um, in some form to start. We're gonna focus on fruits and vegetables, but we'll also talk some of the other foods that you can do. You get really good color, flavor, and nutrient retention with freezing. You know, your tomatoes pictured here stay that nice um, bright red color. You know, some other methods, color will change. Flavor may not be quite as good. Texture is generally better than some of the other methods of preservation. When you can food in jars, the food cooks essentially in the jars to a certain extent. So the food is softer. Uh, in drying, sometimes the food's a little um, not as tender because it's dehydrated. The good thing about freezing is you have that major piece of equipment, the freezer in your home um, already, and it's really fast and easy. And then on the other side, it adds a lot to convenience for food preparation. I know I, you know, I always have vegetables with my meals. I like fresh vegetables and use them often but sometimes I'm just in a rush. So it's very convenient to open a bag of frozen peas or frozen greens and use them for my meal rather than having to perhaps shell those peas or wash the greens. It just speeds up that step. So you can do this at home just as they do if you went to a market and bought it that way. In freezing, you can match proportions to your family size. So if you only you know, have a family of one or two, and you just want to freeze a small amount, you can do that. When you do um, canning, you're, you have to do certain set um, sizes of jars. Now, there are some disadvantages to freezing. Texture does change on foods. Um, freezing does make the food softer. Uh, it, we'll talk a little bit more about that as we go. The initial investment and cost of maintaining a freezer is high. And when I say initial investment, um, most people are gonna have that refrigerator freezer in their kitchen. But if you're going to do a lot of freezing, uh, perhaps you have a large garden or you are participate in a farm market, um, community supported agriculture, where you get a box of uh, produce every um, week during the season, then you probably at some point would need a standalone freezer. How much you can um, hold, of course, is just limited by your freezer size. A little bit about how freezing affects food. Um, freezing, 
Oh, let's see. So first of all, fruits and vegetables all contain naturally occurring enzymes. And those enzymes are what cause fruit to ripen. Um, and then eventually for that fruit to decay. So you have that uh, tomato on the vine and it starts out green. Enzymes within that green tomato help it to change to that nice juicy red tomato that you wanna use um, for your salad or uh, for your sauce. And then if you continue to leave the tomato more time, those enzymes start to make the tomato much soft, a little too soft, and then eventually causes it to decay. So. In freezing, we want to control enzymes in fruits and vegetables because they are slowed down during the freezing process, but they don't stop. So eventually, unless you control the enzymes in fruits and vegetables, the food will um, get, for instance, mushier, or maybe uh, flavors will change. So we're gonna talk about how you can control those freezing enzymes. In um, backing up here because let me back up a minute. Oops. Interesting. I lost a couple of slides. slides. Um, Bear with me one minute. I need to go back. I'm sorry. One of you wants to. Um, sorry, having a technical difficulty. I apologize. I there's something going on here. <laughs> All right, we're just going to continue. Um, okay, so how freeze the next food? There are textural changes in freezing. So when water in the cells of your food starts to freeze, it expands. Think of the balloon. So if you have a balloon full of water and you freeze it, it expands. And then when the, if you were to take it out and let it thaw, the balloon will collapse. And that's what happens to the cell walls of fruits and uh, vegetables that have a very high water content. So as the, um, let's say your iceberg lettuce, if you put that in the freezer, those cells have so much water in them as they expand and freeze, when you thaw the food, they just collapse and what you get is a bunch of mush. So some foods, because of their high water content, are not, um, get very mushy. So we would say those are ones that you may not freeze. They include things like celery, lettuce, some tomatoes, um, slicing tomatoes uh, don't freeze as well as plum tomatoes because they have more, um, water in them. And then you have to think about how you might use it in a tomato. You're not going to be able to freeze a tomato and have a salad tomato, but you certainly have a tomato that you can add to um, soups and stews. In commercial applications, uh, vegetables are frozen very quickly at very low temperatures, and that minimizes the ice crystals forming. Uh, it's hard to duplicate at home, but what we we're gonna do is try to turn our um, freezers down as low as possible to speed up the freezing. So we wanna freeze foods very quickly. If possible, you're gonna set your freezer at 10 degrees um, below zero for 24 hours ahead. And for most of this, I'm focusing on those um, people who have standalone freezers. You also should spread those packages out around the freezer until they're frozen. Because if you were to stack all your non-frozen peaches together, it takes longer to freeze. For organizational purposes, I want my peaches all together. So I'm gonna spread them out, let them freeze solid, and then regroup all my peaches together so they're easy to find when I wanna use them. 
all of you should have a um, thermometer in your uh, freezer and zero degrees Fahrenheit or below is uh, the temperature that we want for best quality. And we all have dials, but it is important to have a thermometer um, in there as well. Foods need to be cool before freezing. Um, we're gonna talk about the process, but everything is usually put in an ice water bath um, after you blanch it. And then it's packed in um, serving size quantities. You're gonna put foods in containers or packages um, tightly. You wanna avoid a lot of extra air. Uh, you don't wanna waste space. You have extra air in there. It speeds dehydration of the food. Um, there's always evaporation that occurs during freezer. The longer something's in the freezer, the more evaporation that will occur. And that evaporation shows up as what we refer to as freezer burn. And that's that white dried out area on the edge of your green beans or the edge of your um, chicken breast. It makes the food tough very unappetizing. It won't hurt you, uh, but it's certainly not going to taste good. Also, by packing food tightly, um, we will not waste any space. Most food feeds, uh, foods need some headspace uh, to expand at the top. So that's the space you see here from the top of the corn to the top of the um, container. That allows room for expansion so the top doesn't pop up, pop off. In a bag, you don't have that um, need because a bag would expand um, on its own. Press all your air from bag foods, uh, then twist them down uh, so there's a nice twist tie and use a lid on tight containers. This is really important. Label everything you have. Um, with the name of the product, any ingredients that you might add, what it looks like, because it all looks so clear when you put it in the freezer, you go, I'll remember this was X. So like these are egg whites, that's how they're labeled. Um, but it could also be chicken broth. It could also be vegetable broth. Uh, it's impossible to know six months from now. So label things clearly. You can use a China marker which is like a green, um, kind of like a crayon. You can use permanent marker on something that you don't care, has a permanent mark on it, like a plastic bag. Um, and a word about that, if you're using plastic bags, make sure those bags are um, dry. And I label mine before I put the food on it in it, because it seems as soon as the bag gets even the least bit cold, even a permanent marker doesn't write on them. So we already I mentioned this, you wanna turn your freezer down before you're going to freeze foods. Um, don't overload the freezer. So if you were freezing, let's say you had a bumper crop of um, peaches and you wanted to freeze a whole lot of peaches at once, you could over overload the freezer and it may not freeze quickly enough. So the general rule is a food that will freeze in 24 hours, which is two to three pounds of food per cubic foot of freezer. Any unfrozen food, some freezers have uh, quick chill areas and or colder areas. You can use those to speed it up, leave some space so the packages um, chill quickly and then arrange your foods so that you use the foods that are in there the longest first. Number nine is keep a frozen foods inventory. Uh, that's a really good tool if you can do it. So basically it means just keeping a list of what you have in the freezer and the quantities. Uh, if you have a chest freezer or a stand-up freezer, I mean, it's easy for food to kind of get towards the back or bottom and you may not see it. It requires that you keep it up to date. So if you take something out, you got to cross it off. If you put something in, you have to add it. And if you have a, um, a larger household, everybody has to be part of the team in keeping that inventory accurate. I will tell you honestly that uh, this doesn't work for me. I've tried it a million times and it just doesn't work. But um, it is a really good tool if you can keep it up. 
and check your thermometer periodically to make sure that the freezer is maintaining zero degrees. So now let's talk about freezing fruits and then we'll talk about freezing vegetables. Uh, freezing fruits. You can freeze fruits in all sorts of forms, meaning whole, sliced, crushed, or juiced. Nothing gets better in freezing. So you always want to start with best quality foods. And this is true for all food preservation. Um, you want that optimum maturity and freshness so that you get the best flavor. Um, immature or overripe produce give you lower quality when frozen and lower quality really in other methods as well. So, you know, find those uh, green beans that are perfectly ripe, not the ones that are maybe been on the vine too long and so they're a little tougher. Those aren't gonna be good for um, freezing. Use your best quality. Wash and work with small amounts of um, fruit at a time. You don't wanna soak the fruit. You wanna, you know, wash any dirt or um, dust off the fruits and then that'll give you the best quality. Fruit, the enzymatic uh, reaction that occurs with some fruits, especially light colored ones, is that fruit tends to darken. Think about an apple, a banana, a peach, and a pear. When exposed to air over time, they don't maintain a really nice light color, they darken. So we treat fruit to prevent darkening um, prior to, during preparation and prior to freezing with ascorbic acid, which is vitamin C. This is uh, one um, direction you could use. It's one teaspoon of ascorbic acid to one gallon of cool water or half a teaspoon to half a gallon. Ascorbic acid, uh, you can um, buy ascorb vitamin C tablets and crush them up. There are directions that are available on our websites, uh, like the University of Georgia one on how to freeze fruit. And they'll tell you how many tablets to crush up to get 3000 milligrams. Just look at the bottle and crush them really fine and then you add them to the water. There are also commercial ascorbic acid mixtures. Uh, one brand name is Fruit Fresh. It's nothing more than vitamins, the ascorbic acid, and also um, some a uh, little bit of stabilizer. You can also heat fruit um, to reduce the darkening, but we don't always want to heat the fruit because it makes it softer and we want it to maintain that as well. Citric acid, lemon juice. Many of us use lemon juice if we're cutting up fruit for a uh, fruit salad, for instance. It doesn't work well in the long run dirt for freezing. So we recommend ascorbic acid rather than lemon juice. Sugar syrups serve another purpose, but they will not maintain color. And salt and vinegar do not maintain color either. Ascorbic acid, as I said, it's, it's very inexpensive. You can buy it powdered or tablets, um, then just crush up the tablets. Uh, you can add that ascorbic acid to the water and then dip the fruit in and then drain it afterwards. Or if you were going to use a syrup with your fruit, uh, you could put it in the syrup itself, um, or you could add it to the sugar if you were using a dry pack, which we'll talk about. So a, um, sugar, you would, if you're using dry sugar, sprinkling it over the fruit and then freezing it, you would dissolve the ascorbic acid in a little bit of water, sprinkle it over the fruit, and then add your sugar. If you wanted to make a crushed fruit, uh, say you were making, I don't know, a peach sauce, you could add that powdered ascorbic acid right into the prepared fruit. Again, the directions on some of the um, resources I'll share are there. Tell you the amounts, you don't have to memorize this. Fruit Fresh uh, the package tells you how much to add. Uh, so follow the directions. Citric acid doesn't work as well. It also really changes the um, flavor. It's not a neutral flavor. It gives you that lemony um, flavor. You can do the steaming. Um, there are some directions for that as well. Most people tend to use the um, ascorbic acid. 
So a little bit about sweetening. Sweetening uh, does not um, make food safe in the freezer. It improves texture. So um, you can freeze fruit without any sugar. You can freeze fruit with any number of um, amounts of syrup in terms of how much sugar would be in there. So a light syrup has about half a cup of sugar to four cups of water. And a heavy syrup has four, um, sorry, four cups of sugar to um, four, four cups of water. Let me do that, yeah. Um, fruit should be covered. It, it improves it improves texture. So your peaches frozen in a syrup will be softer, they thaw quicker, and of course they are sweeter. Uh, if you've ever frozen um, you know, peaches without them, they'll just be harder and the, you'll just have the flavor of the fruit. If you have, you wanna keep your fruit submerged, so you'll make your syrup, uh, boil the water with the sugar, and then you let it cool, and then you pour it over the fruit, and you could crumple up a piece of paper on top of the container and then put the lid on. That'll keep the fruit submerged and that'll keep it from darkening. Otherwise, sometimes the fruit at the top will get a little darker than the rest of it. And that's a better picture of that with the crumpled paper. You can use wax paper or parchment. Sugar pack, um, you take your sliced soft fruits, uh, like strawberries or peaches. And if you add some sugar to them, they make a syrup. And many of us will do that um, even for serving for a uh, meal or dessert. So you just layer your fruit and your sugar in, in the pan or bowl and let it sit for about 15 minutes and you'll have that juice. Again, that um, just adds a little bit of sweetness and it will probably improve the texture of the finished product. Dry pack is um, a method of just freezing the fruit as is, no added sugar. Uh, it's a really good technique. And basically what you do is you take and prepare the fruit. This is rhubarb on the top, sliced. Um, you could take, I use it for blueberries all the time. Uh, you can use it for strawberries, although they're really hard. Um, so you wash them, dry them well, and then spread them out on a tray with sides and then put them in your freezer until they're rock solid frozen and then scrape them either into a container or a plastic bag. And you know, for blueberries, it, it makes it really easy to then shake out um, some blueberries into a small um, strainer. I like to run them under some cold water for just a couple of minutes and then I'm able to put fresh blueberries on my cereal really um, year round. Uh, the, that's the advantage of the tray pack is you can allow, you can have the food come out um, in small amounts that suit your needs. Uh, you can tray pack the peaches, but because they're such a wet um, food, there will always be some sticking. It works best with mostly berries, um, the sliced rhubarb, things that aren't very, um, don't have a lot of moisture. You'll find that some directions tell you you can use pectin syrup. Pectin is what we use for making jams. You can buy it in both powder and liquid forms. And it will help with um, texture of things like strawberries and peaches without adding any additional sugar to that um, fruit. Water or unsweetened juice packs, the texture when it thaws will be mushier. The color and if you don't add the ascorbic acid, um, is still not as good and it freezes harder and takes longer to thaw. If you puree um, any fruit or juices, you, you don't need to add sugar. You would add ascorbic acid if it was light colored, things like applesauce, pear sauce, peaches, strawberry sauce, you, wouldn't, you don't need ascorbic acid because it's a bright color. Sugar substitutes, people always ask, can I use that instead? Um, they will not help with color retention or with texture like sugar does. So they are strictly to add um, sweetness to the product. So 
I probably would add it uh, just before serving to, to the taste that I need rather than putting it in the freezer because it doesn't really make any um, difference to the food in terms of texture. So if you do use sugar substitutes or you use a regular sugar, again, when you're labeling your products, you know, peaches with a light syrup or peaches with um, equal, just so you know what that product is. So freezing vegetables, and if you have questions, put them in the chat and we'll make sure we answer them now or later. Um, freezing vegetables, you want, again, best quality in, gets you better quality out. This is some Swiss chard in the foreground. Sort things for size and ripeness so that it, all your, um, you know, lima beans are about the same size. Again, wash, uh, gel, don't soak things, just put them in a colander and use the sprayer on them. Small quantities at a time work best. Now, we don't use ascorbic acid for vegetables. We use blanching as for steaming to um, protect against enzyme changes. Um, the enzymes that change will affect both texture, color, and flavor in vegetables. It is an easy process and basically it's putting the food in a pot of boiling water for a specific but short amount of time uh, to uh, inactivate the enzymes and also to, it does um, remove or kill some of microorganisms that might be there. It makes things a little easier to pack because they're more flexible than if they were uh, fresh from the garden. So there are couple of exceptions, tomatoes and peppers. You don't need to blanch. Everyone um, that I know uh, says they're just as good um, six months down the road if you skip the blanching step. So we'll talk about tomatoes um, specifically, but it does make it a little easier. People always say to me, oh, I never blanch. I just freeze it. If it works for you, okay. And if you're only gonna freeze the food for a very short period of time, a couple months, uh, it may be all right. But if you wanna keep something six months or more, you really need that blanching to um, inactivate the enzymes. The pot pictured here uh, is a blanching pot or it could be a spaghetti pot too, a pasta pot. So what you need is a big pot with a strainer in it. I'll show you um, one at the end of the presentation, another type that you can use. And this allows you to do multiple batches. If you only want to do one batch of vegetables at a time, you could just put the vegetables in a pot of boiling water and then dump them into a colander over the sink. But this would allow you to do several batches in a row without losing that hot cooking water. So you'd need a blancher or a big pot with a basket and a lid to do multiple batches. If you're just doing one, you really don't need the basket. You need one gallon of water per one pound of vegetables. That's so that you can get the uh, vegetables um, blanched really quickly. Uh, if you have too many vegetables in there, the water won't um, maintain that boil and you'll, it'll take too long. So you Fill your pot with water, bring it to a boil. You put your vegetables in the um, vigorously boiling water. Keep the lid on so that the boil stays or comes right back. As long as the bo boil comes back within a minute, you would start the clock as we say when, the when you put those food in. So here we had some kale and spinach. So I would put my fresh kale and spinach in. If the water comes, I start the clock. It's three minutes in the boiling water for blanching um, spinach and Swiss chard and kale, all your greens. And then at the end of the three minutes, I would chill them down quickly uh, in a colander in cold, ideally ice water, um, so that we stop that cooking process. Now, if I had too many greens in there and it took several minutes for the water to come to a boil, they the timing should start when the water gets to a boil. So small quantities of food are um, much more effective. You should also have either um, 
pan with ice water because we want to stop that cooking process really quickly. Or if you have really cold tap water, that would work as well. And then you'd let, once the food's um, drained, as you can see here, it was um, packaged and labeled. And I, I even made a note on there that said it was blanched for three minutes, which is the um, recommended time. Um, so that I know, you know, the cooking's already started when I take it out to use it at the other end. There, where do you know, find out how long to blanch foods? Uh, there are fact sheets on the, the University of Georgia website. You can, um, we'll give you the link to that. Many of the food preservation books, like the books on canning, also have a section on freezing, and they will tell you how long to blanch different kinds of foods. And as you might guess, something like the greens um, that are pretty thin, it's about three minutes. Something like green beans is also three minutes. Something like carrots is five minutes if it was small whole carrots. So it depends on the size and the type of the food. And these have been scientifically tested to give you the best quality product um, when it's done. You could also, instead of blanching in boiling water, you could steam, you would use a uh, steamer basket like this with the boiling water underneath it. It's done, the food has to be a single layer and it usually takes one and a half times longer than water blanching. Um, I've never used steamer blanching because I'm always doing more quantities of food and this would just take uh, way too long because like you'd see that's all the beets you would be doing and typically I'd probably be doing more. Freezing tomatoes or peppers. I said this is the easiest food to freeze because no blanching is required. Your choices are uh, freeze them whole, quartered. You could, you know, tomatoes, you might puree or make a sauce. Um, so for freezing whole, you would wash your tomatoes. You could take the stem and out. Uh, and then if you have freezer space, my advice is just put them into large freezer bags and throw them in the freezer and freeze them till they're rock solid. And when you take them out, the skins will slip right off as they start to thaw. Uh, for peppers, uh, you want to core and seed the peppers. Usually you freeze them in halves or cups, or uh, perhaps you're gonna chop them up for um, freezing. If I was freezing peppers, I would chop them and then freeze them on a tray like those blueberries. And once they're frozen solid, I would put them in bags. That way I could shake out as much chopped pepper as I would like later on. I freeze my jalapenos this way. I usually just cut those in half and seed them. And then I'm able to pull them out for when I wanna make something with some um, little bit of kick to it. You can also um, say eat, any of these methods work and this is some nice uh, sauce. Actually, I think it's Sandra's sauce um, ready for the freezer. And label and date what it is because you, you're gonna wanna know is that's just pureed tomatoes or is this a tomato sauce that has other ingredients? You won't know six months from now. Um, for, so for freezing your fruits and vegetables. All of this is really easy. It gets you a really delicious product. Follow directions for times for blanching um, and you'll have really good success. When it comes to some other foods, um, just some other tips, breads and baked goods, uh, you know, could be muffins or cookies. They tend to dry out over time. So shorter freezing times is a good idea meat, fish, and poultry, larger pieces like a turkey, the storage for best quality is a year, a cut up piece of um, a cut up chicken where you might have the, the breast and the legs, that is less time because the smaller pieces tend to dry out sooner. Uh, they do recommend double bagging uh, fish for instance, so maybe wrapping the fish fillets in uh, plastic wrap and then putting them in freezer bags to help prevent um, the food from drying out. I like to freeze casseroles and um, I'll show you some freezing tools in a, 
couple minutes here, but uh, soups, all of those things are really easy to freeze. You can freeze um, stock if you make extra stock for, um, from your vegetable things for your be ready to go rather than having to buy canned stock. And I think we've covered most of it. So, um, oh, one of the things. So what if, what to do if your freezer goes out? One of the concerns um, is we do get storms, whether it's um, uh, power outages in the winter or the summer. And then it's really important to protect all our food and keep it safe. The best thing you could do during a power outage is to keep the door closed. Make a note of the time that the power goes out. Take a quick peek and at your thermometer periodically. And um, I'm talking more about the freezer that's in your uh, kitchen than a standalone freezer. So a kitchen freezer that's pretty full, you know, is gonna not last as long as one of those standalone freezers that's packed full. A full kitchen freezer lasts about two days. Um, a half full freezer, probably a day at most. Uh, food in a standalone freezer will last a lot longer. And by last, I mean it stays frozen longer. If possible, if you're gonna have a prolonged power outage, adding block ice or um, even bagged ice is helpful. If you had access to dry ice, that would work as well. I tend to um, freeze, uh, bottles of water, like I'll take an empty seltzer bottle, wash it out and fill it with water and freeze that. And I keep those empty bottles, those water bottles in my freezer for the extra space. So if the power goes off, they'll help keep food cold. And they're also ready to go for a picnic. Um, then make a note of when the power comes back on and take a look at all the food. Is the food still frozen? great if the food still has ice crystals in it. That is also um, good. If food has thawed, then you'll need to consult some recommended times for recommended um, some publications for recommendations to whether that food would be safe. 